unburied dead are coming back to life. Coming back to life. My name's Mark Warman. I'm Darren Kirkpatrick. And we get paid to bring dead cars back to life. We work with my best friend Royal and my son-in-law Josh. We search far and wide to find how a car was built, where it spent its life, and how it died. After that, we bring it back to look exactly the way it did on the day it was born. If we don't kill each other. We do everything. We do everything. You do nothing. We do it all. And well, everybody's talking about it. We prepare and do everything, and you just come out and put it together, and you get all the glory. Everybody says the same thing. I could do all of it by myself. But you know what? You want to? How long no, would it I don't. Want to. Yeah, yeah. Be careful. I'm How long would it take to, you? I'm mature enough to realize I can't do it all by myself. So right now the guys are kind of ticked off because I spend a lot of time up in the office. What I got to get across to them is that because I'm in the office doesn't mean I'm not working. You know, what's he gonna, now, he's now where are you going? Now you know exactly where I'm going. The counseling on him is not working. <laughs> It's not working. You wow. want a job? Here's your job. What is it? You're going to help me. What because what did I tell you about working on a car? What did I tell you a thousand times about working on a There's car? There's more to a car than just a wrench. Yes. There's more to work. Well, another word we like to use. We like to group words together. There's more to working on a car than, just, than using just a wrench. Yeah, you use your brain. You research them. Because we can't go forward if we don't know what happened. We don't know If we don't know that the car might have got a dealer installed accessory, right? Right. So I'm going to give you... What happened to your ears? Getting these guys to focus is borderline impossible. So maybe if I give them their own cars with their own VIN numbers, their own history to search out, they can report back to me something intelligible with any luck at all and maybe begin to learn the importance of what I do in the office. That's your car, okay? okay? I want you to learn everything there is to know about that car, both now, as in learn what options it has, okay, how it's built, where it was made, I want all those things, but then I'm gonna have you start doing the research on it. Okay. Because you guys say I'm up here all the time and you want me out there, I'm fine to be out there. But I can't follow who owned that car and when it was owned and where it was sold new. I can't do all those things. It makes a huge difference in it. And why are you chiming in? I actually hate Darren. And you're always making fun of us. How do you expect us to get anything done? You can you, make fun Uncle of Fester. for everything. I have, your, I have limited knowledge. You know so what, just you do have limited work. knowledge, but I'd like you to have more knowledge. I'm gonna give you the Sunroof Challenger. Oh, that's, that's a actually, nice of you. Yeah, yeah, since they made about nine of them or so. Mm -hmm. Mark assigned me the uh, sunroof car to track down the history on. The history is a part of the car, I understand that, but the research part is not real fun for me. You, 71 Cootie, you know the most about it. Rubble. My point is this, okay? It's real simple. I know you guys get all frustrated because I'm up there in the office doing nothing. But do you realize that just one phone call could lead to the original number matching motor? You should know that. You've been around here long enough to know that. So when I'm up there, I'm not just goofing around. I'm actually working. I'm, but but I'm, not, I'm working with my brain. I'm not working with my hands. Though I can do that perfectly, as you can see right here. Okay. One of the very first things that I try to do when I acquire a car, if it does not already have the original motor and the original transmission or what they dub numbers matching, um, I go on a hunt to try to find that. I find the original numbers matching motor and numbers matching transmission, I add 25% to the value of a car. That's worth taking the time and finding the original parts. Is it worth $16,000 and reuniting a car with its original motor that it left the assembly line with 40 years ago? Is it worth taking a few hours and backtracking it? Yes. Sure. Rest my case. The 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner is completely finished and is on our showroom floor waiting for the owner to come down and pick it up. The 1971 Plymouth Cuda 344 speed triple black Phantasm homage car is in the process of having the rest of the bodywork finished on it and ready to be turned over to me for final block sand and paint. The 1971 Dodge Charger RT 446 pack triple green car, one of my favorites, is waiting for the exhaust system to show up, carburetors, radiator, front and rear bumpers, and then we're ready to finish the assembly on it. Meanwhile, I still have to find somebody that can dip the 1971 CUDA 446 barrel four-speed shaker hood car. And we're fortunate that we have a good client base and a lot of cars to work on. 
But while we're waiting for a lot of pieces of parts, this is gonna be a great opportunity for me to take time, sit down with each one of the guys, and explain to them, and hopefully get it into their mind, how important the history of these cars is, how important finding the original parts off of these cars is. So basically, I'm just gonna give each guy his very own car, and I'm gonna cut them loose. setting Josh up with the sandblast pressure pot so he can do the few spots outside on the 70 sunroof car. Darren and I are going to start doing some research history together on the orange 71 Cuda. And this address was in the phone book. The phone number is no good now. We're attempting to get a phone number for Greg Mickelson, who is a prior owner of the 71 orange Cuda. We're sorry. Good, nice. Your call cannot be completed as dialed, or the number has been disconnected. Sorry, that listing again, please. Okay, Gregory Mickelson and Eugene. There he be is, him. right there. That's him. See, Greg Mickelson has two mutual friends. Weird. Okay. What are the odds of that? Colette and Josh's mom. Uh oh, a little bit of hanky panky here. I wouldn't assume that automatically. No, I'm joking. It was a joke. Hey, mom. Um. Give me a call back. You said that you were headed down here. So I've been trying to get a hold of my mom for the past hour and a half. My mom apparently knows Greg. I don't know how. Nothing. Uh, I've tried calling, tried texting. She hasn't called back or texted back or anything. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Now you answer. Um, I have a question for you. So we have a fan on uh, the Graveyard Cars Facebook site. His name is Greg Mickelson. It's amazing. Not only was Greg Mickelson a fan on our Facebook page, but he was some kind of friend of Josh's mom's. So you actually know him really well, though. Yes, I do. I know him. We worked out every night. We worked out at the Fall Creek Nursery out there. Huh? Yeah, I can uh, I'll Facebook him and see if I can get his phone number if you want. That would be great. Okay, cool. All right, thanks, Terry. Okay, talk to you later. Okay, bye. All right, thanks, Mom. Okay, bye, honey. Okay, bye. There's your small world for you. If you do anything stupid, I'm gonna kick your kidneys in, you fool. We're gonna go check out the crash site. It brings back mixed emotions. I start cutting the heck out of his motorcycle seat, and I don't see him for days after that. ready to go off to the machine shop. I'm gonna start blocking the lines out for the very same car that motor came out of, the 71 Triple Black Cooper. I don't like bending over like this. I'm too old. Sit on this, Royal. Cool. Where's mine? Oh, God, it's always gotta be about Derek. Oh, Josh, what is wrong with you? To get a car glass smooth with perfect lines. One of the things I have to do is establish the style lines in the beginning, and I do it with tape. I'll usually put a mark at the very, very front, a mark at the very, very back, and I put a piece of tape between them. So once I do that, I mark that style line with my pen every few inches. So right now I'm getting ready to do the, uh, the final block and glaze coating that has to go on. So I'll take and sand back and forth. It's called cross sanding. Overall, it has to be flat as glass before I spray my first coat of paint. That feels good to you. As long as you've been working on it, it should be. No, it needs more material, that's what I'm saying. Why? You can't feel that. Gouge out my eyes, set fire to my face, and I can still feel that. Blindfold you. Blindfold anything you want, fool. Okay. Darren was just over there helping me with blocking the deck lid, and like I tried to explain to all of them, you have to know, you have to have the feel in your hand. If you have the feel in your hand, you don't even need your eyes. <laughs> That sounded better was a choking to death. Hey, you look like a ninja. Ninja turtle. If you do anything stupid, I'm gonna kick your kidneys in, you fool. Okay, hey buddy, right there in front of you. Now you already know where it's at, because you know the How do I know where it's spin it around? Spin well, you it still around. Know the shape spin of it the around. Deck. Hey, come on up here, come on. <laughs> spin it around, fool. No, you'll still know the shape of the lid. Come I'll on know here. it because I'm good at what I do. Okay, come on over, buddy. Just walk forward about four or five feet. No, oh, you're fine. Okay, down. There you go. All right, buddy. Can you see through that or not? I cannot see anything. Well, your nose makes that stick out. 
where your nose is. It's like Elephant Man or something. Take the cap off that. Get the f out. Here. Okay, now sand it to perfection with the blindfold on. I'm not a Shaolin priest! So basically, once again, and it, amazingly, I had to prove my point by having a stupid blindfold on. I found every high and every low completely blind, and they sanded in agreement with what I found on the lid. So, you're welcome. Have you bothered to get the bolts for this when it gets up in the air, or you just kind of all stand around and look at each other? They're on it. Oh, nice, Mark. They're on it, Mark. We got it right here. We got it covered. I've known Mark for 30 years. I know how he thinks. He came over to babysit us on the motor. He didn't need to. He just likes to be the big man on campus. We don't need babysat. We can take care of it ourselves. Whoa! <laughs> That's that why. Good. That should be good on there. And we're leaking in. Oh, somebody didn't put the pin in that uh, in that leg. They're running around like everything's everything, throwing wrenches and stuff. The next thing I know, the motor's all over the ground. Well, I guess everything isn't everything, is it? Well, uh, what just happened is the uh, pin was missing in the leg. I knew it when I started to lift it up. Uh, I looked for it, had some, asked somebody else to look for it. Nobody found it, obviously. God, you guys are miracles, just walking miracles. I've been in this room for probably about 20 minutes, just sipping on my energy drink, and I feel great. So, kind of playing the waiting game on Mark, you know, which is fine, but I kind of wish he'd hurry up at the same time. There's knowledge to be known, something. I assigned Josh the 1971 Green Charger RT446 pack car. I want you to be able to report to me one cool thing. Okay. I mean, that, that'll make you a hero. I'll, I'll grab the phone. You, you just uh, give me a second. Damn. Okay. So there are two names and phone numbers on the outside of the jacket for the 71 Charger RT. Dave and Jim. Oh, whoops. I got to dial out. <laughs> Hey Dave, how's it going? My name is Josh Rose and I am with a television show called Graveyard Cars and I'm trying to track down some history on a 1971 446 pack uh, Dodge Charger. It was our guy, uh, so I went ahead and left him a message with the phone number, everything, so he should be giving us a call back. I hope, I, I really hope, or else Mark seems to think that he can take his wrath out on me. You walk like a duck. I walk like a duck. That's great. That's... Here's how you walk. How do you walk? Do you I walk like this? Yeah, pretty much. No, I don't. My, how would I ever get anywhere? I don't know. Look at my footprints. Why do you get so angry? I get mad because you do this horse crap every time. I don't walk like a duck. Look at my footprints. I'll just walk. No, now you're bringing No, I'm forward. walking just yeah. normal. I know that they're a little bit out. A little? Look at this. Okay, there. The good news is I got Josh to help me out with one of my hundred tasks in the course of a day. The bad news is I still have to paint the fender for the 71 Cuda, but it's ready. But you know, if we had a, a, a crime scene and a criminal investigation, they would have said a duck was there by the way you walk. All I have to do is endure Darren for the next 45 minutes while I'm painting it and everything should be fine. You know what I want you to do? I want you someday to listen to yourself and the foolishness that comes out of you. After 10 years he, of schooling, he on it even this morning. FBI, FBI training, how to inspect a crime scene. That you're gonna go to your sergeant and say, oh yeah, you know what, I think it was a duck. Because <laughs> of my feet print. And you'll say you're quacked. Hi, this is Josh. 
Hey, this is Dave. How you doing? Hey, Dave. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty well. I'm trying to find the history about a 1971 uh, Dodge Charger. Well, we struck out on that one. I'm a rookie. Look at that high line. Look at that. He's got that all messed up right there. Somebody started out putting the tape on wrong. That tape line represents a body line, and they had, did not have the body line on the right place on the fender. All I'm saying is it's just not that, it's not rocket science, my God. It's well, not even not close everybody's to rocket talented science. as you are, Mark, sometimes, okay? That's what you tell us daily. Hello. Hi, is there a Jim Ross available? This is him. Hey Jim, how you doing? My name's Josh and I work for a company called Graveyard Cars. Well, I'm trying to find some history about a uh, 1971 Dodge Charger. 446 pack, dark green. Oh, right. I'm actually just trying to find out as much history about it as I, as I possibly can. Did you personally own the car yourself? Yeah, I bought it off a guy. Uh, I don't even think I even have his name. He pretty much didn't remember anything about it. He, he, he remembers the car exactly. And you probably wouldn't know anything about um, the, the original motor or the transmission at all? No, no, that stuff is long gone. Okay. Do you have uh, any pictures by any chance of this vehicle? Uh, you know, I might have one side shot of oh, it. Oh, excellent. Is, is there any way that maybe we can get a copy of it? Let me get a pen and paper so I can get your email. I'll uh, send you a copy. Okay. Yeah, that'd be marvelous. He said that he had maybe one picture he had saved to the computer. So I'm going to go ahead and tell Mark about that. I really enjoy doing the actual spraying of the cars. The thing is, when people say that 90% of it's in the prep, it really is. It's probably more like 95% is in the prep. So it's just great to be able to finally get to the point where you can hold the paint gun in your hand and lay out that sheet of glass that you've been telling everybody you're gonna do for the last two months. You're gonna find out what life was like on 14th Street. Once you start making phone calls, the odds of finding something out are gonna increase by like a factor of 10. We're gonna go check out the crash site. It brings back mixed emotions. Chromium diomside. Nobody out here by that name. <laughs> what are you doing? Clean, hey, us, clean us up to take the engine room. Question for you. 1970 Dodge Challenger sunroof car. Remember that? Yeah. The one I gave you? What'd you find out? Not a thing. Is that why the file's still sitting next to my desk? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I have not found out anything. Because you haven't made a phone because call. Because I haven't made a phone call. That'll help. Now I'm not gonna be. Once you start making phone calls, the odds of finding something out are gonna increase by like a factor of 10. I'd rather be producing on the car, putting the car together, you know, watching it come together. That's more fun than searching the history. You don't think it's important, do you? Truthfully. Yeah, it's just not something, I don't like talking on the phone. Do you remember where we grew up? Yeah. We're going on a tour to Springfield. <laughs> you may not like it, but you're going. We're looking for you, fool. We're going on a tour to Springfield. I have a question for you. I'll be heard. You know what it's like to have a passion about something? What are you passionate about besides your family? 
Like what video? I know you're into video games. What I love video games. I love I love music. I have a passion for good music. Okay, but you haven't got an ounce of talent in your body. Tell me about something you could be talented at. Drawing. Huh? Draw? I want to draw. Draw, okay. Artistic. The reason we're going on this, Royal knows he grew up with me in this neighborhood. Okay. What did me and Josh come along for? Yeah. You're coming along, so you can appreciate two guys who grew up in the hood with nothing. You can appreciate the cars that we're working on more if you realize where we came from. You ever see Rocky Six? Full circle. This is full circle. This is my neighborhood. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. Whatever, hey. fool. This is my old Catholic church. I grew up, I was baptized and ended over here. This is the old convent. They don't have nuns anymore, I guess. You, Uncle Fester. What are you doing? Thinking about what? You're not trying to do the thinking guy's pose, are you? No, I was thinking. I have yeah. limited knowledge. I'm gaining more. Did you ever come down here when we had the skateboards or not? No. I don't think so. Before they put these up here, Burp. this was just, just a dirt mound with grass on it. We'd play King of the Hill when we was kids down here. Ride our skateboards around. I rode it around so fast, I think I tore up some of the concrete, and that's why you got those signs now that say no skateboarding. It's my gas. Okay, we're going down to our old neck of the woods. You're gonna find out what life was like on 14th Street. Uh, oh, hello. They must not know who's walking across the street. If they did, they'd be swerving trying to hit you. <laughs> they probably worked on one of their cars. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Free. 14th Street took a lot of animals. We used to have cats, lots of cats. Every day you go up and you gather up your dead cats. They just, That's it's a busy, it was a busy street. Why don't you guys just keep them inside? No, we did a lot of them, but they get out the door. This is my old house here. It's where a lot of action happened. That's where the pool table was when you spit on it, too. <laughs> what? Royal spit directly on my pool table. Right on it. Hawk a loogie right in the middle of my pool table. And that's what got your motorcycle you seat. smashed my fingers. That's what got his motorcycle seat cut up. I didn't spit on his pool table until he smashed my fingers. I mind my own business getting ready to play a game of pool with Royal. Royal, lazy, hangs his fingers over the edge of the pool table. So what happens? It's right in my line of vision. I ask him to remove me because they're not in your way. So bam, I line up the cue ball and I just tag his fingers, which I'm sure did hurt. He'd smash him with the cue ball. He'd line that cue ball, that cue up, and smash my fingers when I wasn't looking. So then he throws a great big fit. But after he smashed my fingers, I spit on it. So let's, let's get it off, let's, you know, let's knock him out. Instead, Royal, like a little girl, he run. I took off running. I pick up the rock, I chuck it a couple of times down there at him, I can't hit him, it makes me so mad. I go back to the house, there's this motorcycle, and there's a sling blade. Some people call it a Kaiser blade, I call it a sling blade. I pick it up, I start cutting the heck out of his motorcycle seat, and I don't see him for days after that. Your fingers were hanging over the edge when I was trying to make a shot, you were trying to distract me, because I was about shot. to win a big gulp. Those are stains for my charger, right there. We pulled the transmission out like three times here, and we didn't have drip pans like you did because you were spoiled when you were a kid. Yeah, we you probably had a hoist out. and everything. We didn't have any of that. Yep, I think so. We, we just had to drop them right out there. This walk around Springfield is just another one of Mark's many excuses to talk about himself. I mean, it is all about himself, he believes. So he just wants to take us out and torture us more, telling us about things we really don't care about. And then down the hall, kitchen on the right, my sister's room on the left. Mine was the last bedroom on the left. Must be nice having your own bedroom, huh? Room. Yeah, it was. It was three by three. So that's the house I grew up in, me and Royal, right here in this very spot. Pulled my 70 Charger down here, did the very first cleanups on it. Used mom, all of mom's, uh, all of mom's Ajax uh, cleaner on the top. Roll up ads. Well, did, no. Uh, where were you? Were you not there? The walk didn't so much help me as far as wanting to go and start digging up history on Mopars, but the walk itself, it was actually kind of cool. I had fun. You know, it was fun going back and seeing the old place where we used to have a lot of fun, um, hanging out in the garage. We don't really care about where he lived or where he went to school or, or what happened to him as a child. Neither does anyone else. I think Darren had a pretty sheltered life. He believes that walking around the block has to do something with the history of the automobiles he's restoring. He wasn't completely focused on what I was trying to achieve. How can you tie those two together? History is kind of cool, you know. I can see where the history of the cars would, you know, be fun to learn. I mean, I, I don't need any more inspiration. I'm already inspired enough to go and start digging up more history on cars. I still don't want to call people. I'd rather be putting the cars together. But to get Mark off, off my back, I'll sit down and make a couple of phone calls. That'll make him happy. Hello. 
Hi, I'm uh, Royal with uh, Graveyard Cars. Have you seen this on TV yet? Um, I'm just calling to see if you or anyone you know knew about a 70 Challenger with the sunroof. If uh, I'm just looking for some information on it. If you could uh, call me back at this number, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. I did my part. I made my phone call. I made my phone call. Just like you told me. I, know. I, know. I just called him. Call him again. I believe parts of what he said happened. This looked to me like it had a direct impact or something there. That brings back mixed emotions. I wish you would just listen. I wish you would just listen. Hello? Hey, is this Greg? Hey, Greg. We finally got the telephone number for Greg Mickelson, who used to own our beloved uh, 71 Cuda 446 barrel orange car. So can I pick your brain a little bit on that car? Sure. Working on these cars means history. We got the car like from a guy out of Medford who got it from a guy outside of Culp Creek area. When you have an idle minute and no part in your hand, do the other version of work on these cars up here. And he got it from the kid that wrecked it. When I talked to Greg, he had also heard urban legends about how the CUDA was wrecked. What he did was he turned around and he was passing one of his buddies in a truck on a corner out by Monroe. And it was, you know, like one of those real just hairpin corners. Some of the things added up to the stories that we were told uh, years ago when we got the car. And other things weren't so uh, clear anymore. And then he flew up over the top of the truck and landed backwards and, you know, kind of crunched it going back the other way. Jeez, how how fast was he going? Did he ever? Uh, probably about eighty or so. Huh. Gee, many. In order to put the uh, the tires on it, I had to cut three inches off the, the uh, front fenders and, and, and the front so it could actually have a turn radius. So one of the things that I always do when I'm talking to somebody who claims to have owned a vehicle in the past is try to extract some kind of information about something that was done to the car that might still be represented today by looking at the car. So off the front of the fender, there's a, th okay, because I've got one of the original fenders. Yeah, yeah, if you look down towards the bottom, it's been <laughs> black or a couple inches. That was to accommodate the 50 series tires on it all the way around. And that's how I know that he's talking about the exact same car that I'm talking about. Yeah, and it, it also had the, uh, 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 to the four speed, it had a, uh, uh, a console with a pistol grip uh, shifter in it. It had the console? The data plate for the 71 Cuda shows clearly that the car was not built from the factory with a console in it. Someone might have added it later. I really had a nice time talking with Greg. I asked him if next time he's in Springfield, uh, if he wants to come by, uh, show him the old graveyard, show him all the cars, show him his old car. Like, like I said, oh, I'd love to drop by there. It sounds pretty cool. See, uh, see if it looks any different than when he owned it last. Nice guy. <laughs> Knows more about Mopars than you do. No, he doesn't. He sure did. He sure does it. Well, he sure did. A couple things that I thought were weird. He says I had a console, but you know what console brackets look like, right? Yep. One of the things that Greg remembered about the CUDA when he had it was that it had a console, which is interesting because there's no C16 code on the fender tag to support that. The console could have been added by someone, but there was no brackets put on the floor. Therefore, if it was added, it was not added correctly. There's no sign that they were ever in there. The console bracket is very prominent. It's welded to the floor and it's not there. It didn't have a factory console. The data plate would have called that out? It would have, it would okay. have been a C16. Now one thing he said in that was that he put those big TA50s on it, which everybody did. The TA50 was a really wide tire. Uh, it was made by BF Goodrich. It was called the BF Goodrich TA radial. We just cut it down to TA50s or TA60s. Uh, a lot of the guys that wanted the big wide tires on the front had to cut a piece of the fender off so that on a turn, the tire would clear the fender. He said he cut that fender. And there you go. Greg says that this thing went over and hit into a ditch and then 
somehow flipped up or something. The most confusing part for me, because I've really analyzed the stories of the original crash, was uh, Greg's version of it. And then this truck went under it and it clumps and it rolls back down on its wheels into the embankment in the back. Uh, the guy that wrecked the car said he went out around on the left-hand side to pass the truck as it got straight. That's when he oversteered, lost control, hit an embankment on the right-hand side, got shot across the road to the left-hand side, hit an embankment, and ended up laying dead in the middle of the highway. I believe parts of what he said happened, truly did happen, but there's evidence that exists on the car now that did not support everything he said that happened. Look at this. Doesn't that look like it went sideways into a pole? pole or a tree. That's, That's the kind point. of impact you get from that, yeah. That's my point exactly. Mark is going to send Josh and I out to the crash site again to see if we can find out any more clues as to how the accident actually occurred. So this is the right fender. It could be anywhere. If he went around backwards, it could be on the opposite side of the road. We're going to look for a pole and or a tree and or a post that the car might have actually come into contact with back when it was wrecked back in the 80s. I want to know if there's a pole anywhere there that would do that damage. Boom. We're going to go check out the crash site of the 71 440 CUDA, see if there's anything uh, that uh, the CUDA hit, maybe a, a telephone pole or a tree or a dent in the, uh, the street sign or something, who knows. Maybe we'll come up lucky, maybe we'll find something. I've actually never been up here before, so and I've got my little navigator right next to me. Ain't that right, Darren? Wake up! Put on my nasty hat. Dumb and Dumber, Josh and Darren are out at the crash site, uh, hopefully following my specific instructions. Morons, look at Fender and compare it to any trees or poles. I wish I could have done this myself, but I'm busy. Saving the world, Mark. Well, there's lots of poles. Now that would tear up a car. All right, so let me get this straight. The driver of the Cuda, they, they started up there, they started zooming down the street, and he started to lose control right about where that sign is up there. We don't know where he lost control. All I know is he ended up wrecking right in here. Okay, so this is the crash zone. More or less, Over yeah. in here somewhere. If they pay attention to how the car was crushed on the right front and the left rear, all they gotta do is find like a pole. See that little tag? So go down there, over there, jump the ditch, Go over there and get that little number off that big K. That'll tell us or probably. Or I could just take a picture with my phone. You're not going to be able to read the picture, are you? Oh my. So I'm going to have to go down, go around, read it, right? I'm not going to attempt to jump the ditch. 291609-1405. No. TPL. The one below that. Fine, Darren. We'll do it your way. If you would just listen. I wish you would just listen. I wish that you would just fall apart into a... That's exactly what Mark's talking about, Josh. No, don't try to make me feel like a bastard. That's exactly what Mark's talking about. You don't know what Mark's talking about. You don't know what you were talking about. I thought you were going to have some athletic ability when you jump across I the do, chair. Darren. Do you? Well, um, I hate to break it to you, but the only number that's on here is 2004. That's when this pole was put in. Right. So it's been replaced. It was hard to get you to do that, wasn't it? Ow! Did you guys get that on film, I hope? Where it slapped him? That's what you get for being a smart aleck. I hate you. It might look good now, but I don't think anybody in the world's gonna pay us 20 hours to put a tour together on one. But it looks well, good. It looks good, it works, bottom line. And it looks like the pull itself was made in 93. I was really optimistic, hoping to find something. But we kind of came up empty-handed, didn't really find much. But it was a really good time to get away and just kind of act juvenile for a while. Score one for the new guy, the rookie. I believe parts of what he said happened. This looked to me like it had a direct impact or something there. <laughs> Very nice. Well, uh, 
I got in touch with Jeff and uh, he sent me a picture of the 71 Charger 446 pack. I only spent like an hour or two on the phone and, you know, check it out. I already got a picture. Imagine what we could find out if we spent even more time doing that. Score one for the new guy, the rookie. This guy right here. Eat that, Mark Warman. You know, I thought this thing was long gone. Does it look any worse than when you owned it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it looks a lot worse. Uh, my name is Greg Mickelson. I owned the car from the late 70s uh, to the early 80s. Uh, I was the last owner to have the car that didn't crash it. <laughs> you actually had it for a while. Yeah. And you drove it quite a bit? Oh yeah, it was a definite chick magnet. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> That's I the mean, beauty of the I Kudas, mean, uh, man. They, they oh, yeah. Every one of these cars that has spent any time at all on the road has a story to tell. If you look at the front end of this, I've had this on the frame rack, and I know it looks sad, but we've already made pulls on it. <laughs> it still looks bad. <laughs> yeah. But there's, we have the rest of the front end pieces out back. Mm -hmm. um, my problem is, everything's this way. If you look at, if you look at this apron, it yeah. should be in straight line with this right here. Mm -hmm. So this edge of the fender should be here. So it's over a foot. Greg took a few minutes with me and he explained to me how he had heard about the wreck. You know, here's the car here. He comes around it like this. He oversteers coming back through. He, he loses it. On hits, that side hits, of the road. Hits on this side of the road, oh. on this side over here, and then flips up and now over the top of sense. it. And because that, that way it catches the back also too. But, uh, and, and that corner is kind of consistent I with something see. like that happening. He could have come back up, some version of it, mm -hmm. up, and that truck came right underneath him. Correct, yeah. So he told me that the Ford truck and the guys, they were buddies of his. Yeah. That there was actually orange paint on the roof of the truck. There might have been as he was flying over it, but so I mean. So you think he literally flew over the top? If you catch something in the ground to turn around and go 10, 15 feet up in the air, I mean, that, that could happen really Like quickly. a catapult. Yeah. yeah, basically, yeah. Just like all the guys I know who ever had muscle cars, we had to sacrifice the cars to be able to support the rest of our lives, which usually meant uh, family, school. Uh, I met a gal that either lose the car or lose me. Same story, so uh, I lost the car, kept her. Well, now she's gone, I wish I had my car back. It was one of those things of where you got laid off and you know, you just you just had to make ends meet. Uh, you know, it's one of those things of where you kind of bite your tongue and say, you know, well, I'll get another one or it'll happen again. But, you know, the reality is that, you know, those are a one in a lifetime type deal. So, you know, you just, you're not going to see something like that again. So that is where you cut it, right here. Mm -hmm. I figured, okay, it's stable enough. I can cut it and get away with running the 50s on it. And it makes it like a slot car. So, you know, you can stick it in a corner and it just holds really well. You had it in the late 70s, 318 in it. Yeah. 440's gone. Yeah. Can you even remember back thinking to yourself? Where Did was you it? Hear either where was it or you heard a story of where it was? Anything at all? I had, I had heard that it had been blown, so. Oh. Yeah. You, you can talk to like kids today about, you know, old cars. They have no concept. It was awesome talking with Greg and hearing about his old Mopar stories and just getting to talk about Mopars with him in general. To bring back old Detroit muscle, I mean, it's just like, you know, they've, that's something they've got to hear, see, and experience. You know, I mean, it's just, you, you can't really describe it. It's just something that you learn, you know, something that you, something that you feel, so. Seeing the car in the shape it's in now, it's kind of, uh, it brings back mixed emotions, uh, you know, uh, I really didn't want to sell the car at the time. Uh, you know, the economy was even worse than it is now. I'm kind of excited about seeing it when it gets done. You know, that's the uh, that's the cool thing. Yeah. You could just tell him by the way that he looked at it. He really loved that car. Oh, look. There's Darren parting his duster. <laughs> You were ahead of your time. You're George wait, wait, Barris. Wait, wait, wait. Did you see this thing? Yeah. It's amazing. It's got a GTO spoiler, Cuda Shark louvers in the fenders. Let me see that. It was beautiful. That's a really nice car, dude. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Darren? Yeah. That's Darren with his little Magnum PI mustache and his, <laughs> look at those legs, those are nice. They're long. Royal came up to me earlier today and said that uh, we got a lot of work done on the car this week, eh boss? And I'm like, yeah, we did get a lot of work done. 
And it's starting to dawn on them now that you don't have to have your hands dirty, you don't have to have a hood up, you don't have to be laying under a dashboard if you're working on a car. A lot of the working on a car happens up here. Things are going well at Graveyard Cars. Finally, I got it through your guys' simple minds that uh, history on a vehicle is very important and that uh, sometimes when you go uh, back in history, it allows you to be able to go forward into the future. Does that make sense to you now? No. And, and with any luck at all, maybe you guys learned a little something about where I came from. I mean, I, I know that in, in your life, uh, most of y'all pretty much had silver spoons and it's uh, probably a, a real culture shock for you to go on my old stomping grounds. You know, growing up in the hood and having your face kicked in every day, looking forward to it, scheduling people. But that's what sculptured me into the human being that you see before you right now. It boosted Mark's ego. It didn't did. boost anything. What the point of it was is that you guys finally, for the first time, learned how important the history of a vehicle is. That, that, that knowing where a person like myself, one of the greatest Mopar restoration technicians the world's ever known, where did I go? Where did I walk? What, what does that street? have to do with the car restoration? It has to this. do with the fact that you can look back to a, a carport that once housed a 70 Charger, one of the fastest ones in town, I might add. Yeah, we got Royal motivated. So motivated that he actually picked up the phone and dialed one phone number and hung up. So that's huge Didn't for Royal, leave, that's huge. Didn't you leave a message? I don't know if he left a message. I just don't understand. Anyway, uh, Josh, mm -hmm. not only did he find one of the original owners of the 1971 Dodge Charger 446 pack, mm -hmm. but he actually got a photo of it before, oh, nice. way back in the 70s. What do you mean, oh nice, you've seen the photo. Met with one of the original owners of the 1971 Puda 446 barrel. Owned it back in the 70s. That 80s. is, no, he owned it in the 70s. It was wrecked in 1980. Why would we interview a guy who says he drove a car in the 80s when it was wrecked before that, I the title was he driving around the on the back of a tow truck? The 80s, so I really Dude, this is why you got to walk along. Mm -hmm. Hey everybody, Mark here from Graveyard Cars. I can't put the top up until you hit subscribe. So I'm begging you, hit subscribe.